You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brook. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brook, That Gratitude Guy, with you as your host, where my mission is to have guests that recall and relate moments of their lives that have been propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from my weekly guests. And my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It is also available on Apple, Spotify, and Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Uh, Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And I always remind my listeners and viewers that I do gratitude keynote speaking as well as gratitude coaching. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com or as the viewers can see in the background, thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. So let me get on to the show and introduce you to my guest this week, Stephanie James. Let me tell you a little bit about Stephanie. Stephanie James is a uh, transformational life coach and psychotherapist, dynamic public speaker, published author, and filmmaker. Nominated for Fort Collins Woman of the Year in 2014, Stephanie delivers her message in a powerful way to help others find their own internal sparks and create their best lives at the next level. She has an unrelenting commitment to help others actualize their visions and dreams and create tangible, lasting results. Her worldwide weekly radio show and podcast, The Spark with Stephanie James, is a show created to bring you the very best in the fields of psychology, science, and spirituality, and take your life to the next level. In her book, The Spark, Igniting Your Best Life, Stephanie shows us how to transform beliefs that don't serve us, befriend others, ways to develop more authentic and rewarding relationships, cultivate grit, resilience, and joy, and how to approach each day with zest. Sign me up. Stephanie, welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Thank you, David. So good to be here with you. You bet. It's so great to have you. Tell the listeners, I always start out with this because there's a lot of interesting stories around this. Tell the listeners and the viewers how you and I met. Well, we met because of my wonderful partner, Morgan Oaks. And you two had known each other. You have to remind me about that, David. I, all that I know is that when you and I got on together, it was like this instant friendship, like we had just known each other forever. Right, right. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think I, so, I told somebody this one day, when, it, when you don't have that connection, you obviously don't say anything to the person. You just kind of note it. And listen, it's nice to talk to you and talk to you later. But I feel so fortunate when I met Morgan, he and I met at a speaking gig called Exceptional Connections. And, oh, that's got to be eight or nine years ago. We discovered we were born on the same day and so forth, except 25 years apart. But it's interesting. We connected immediately. And then so no surprise when he told me about his his new partner, Stephanie James. I thought, well, it won't be a surprise to me if she's the exact same way. And sure enough, you were. And it's just neat when you connect. And I think I don't know if my brother appreciates me using this, but I have a brother that retired recently, worked at Boeing for 30 or 40 years, but I think he met three or four people in his entire work life there. And I meet three or four new people every day, maybe a dozen. And it's just so thrilling. It's just, oh, and so, so speaking of thrilling and the journey, take the listeners back to maybe not high school, junior high, but maybe college level, early mid twenties, and talk a little bit about the journey that started you to where you are now. Yeah, you know, it it was being about, well, it happened about 13 years old, David. Mm. I actually, I, I feel like one of those super blessed people that I had this amazing childhood, kind of a golden childhood with wow. really loving parents and family around. And then at 13, all of that was changed in an instant as my brother and I watched from the second story window Uh, in the middle of the night, woken up by the sound of screeching tires going down the driveway. Mm. And as we look out the second story window, my mom's peeling out down the driveway and my dad's jumping on the hood of the car. And we've never even seen, you know, my family, you know, my parents argue. And unbeknownst to us, 
my father had told my mother that he was leaving her and was having an affair. Wow. And so that began, you know, everything about this beautiful golden childhood from that moment was irreversibly broken. And um, so it, it became quite a journey. I went from being a daddy's girl who was my daddy's shadow. You know, if dad was literally raking the leaves, I was scooping up the leaves. If he was shaving in the morning, I'd be sitting on his sink with shaving cream all over my face too. And so what happened is, you know, I naturally left with my dad because I was so close to him and really quickly had a new stepmother who made it very obvious that I was not uh, allowed any longer to have any time alone with my father. Mm. Um, I couldn't speak to him alone. I couldn't do things with him alone. And to this day, I'm still not allowed to talk to him alone on the phone. And so it, it, what happened is at 16, I moved back in with my mom. And at that point, my father stopped talking to me for a year. And the message, David, that I had at that point in my life was really, oh my gosh, you know, my own father isn't spending time with me. I can't have this relationship. I must be unlovable. And, and I really carried that with mm. me for probably about a decade of really pain, doing lots of work for sure. Um, and it wasn't until I was at a, I actually had gone to a healing school in San Francisco. And this is kind of the moment of transformation for me was as I walked in, uh, Dr. Jaffe, this is in San Francisco, as I said, shook my hand. And it was one of those moments where you feel like someone is looking into your soul. Mm -hmm. And um, so he went on and there's about 40 of us in this school and he's up on stage presenting and about halfway through, he looks into the audience and he says, hey, you in the blue coat, I have a message for you. And I'm looking around everywhere. And then I look down, I'm like, oh crap, I'm the one in the blue coat. And he says his message and I can't hear him. Hmm. And so I say to my girlfriend next to me, like, did you hear that? And before she can answer, he, he kind of chuckles and says, my dear, what I'm trying to tell you is, and then when he said that, all of the air conditioning units in the place went on and nobody could hear him. Oh, how funny. Wow. So now everybody's cracking up and he's like, okay, my dear, you obviously have a lot of resistance to this. Why don't, you know, why don't you come up here? And so we all came up. He actually called everyone up and we sat on these stairs leading to the stage. And he said, my dear, what I'm trying to tell you is this, what you need to hear is stop trying, mm. stop trying because I'd been trying to earn love. I'd been trying, like if I thought I just had the right, you know, relationship, the right car, the right house, then I would be lovable. And it was like this moment of just awakening where I realized I couldn't, and I didn't have to earn it. I just had to step into it and be it, be that expression of love. And so that started truly the, the second part of my entire life and beyond now you know, this journey of how do I befriend myself and how do I cultivate self-love, which then becomes this amazing healing balm and kind of clear, I call it a conduit for more love and healing to come through me to the world. And, you know, I can't help but ask this question just because you and I are both parents. And I think if you're maybe not a parent, it would be different where you haven't had children and the experience or whatever. But uh, as an example, how old is your dad today? He is 84. So he's 84, which is a senior, I guess you could call it. And he still is not allowed to talk to you by himself without this stepmother or whatever. That just is, and I'm not throwing stones from the glass house. That's just mind boggling to me. I mean, at what point do we let bygones be bygones and realize this is my daughter, this is my son or whatever. And as I said, when a person doesn't have children, I, I understand. I joke about it a lot that, you know, I want to hear about Stephanie's children. I want to hear about your children. I want to hear about what they've done. How's the soccer game? How are they doing? And so forth. And then people that don't have kids, it's okay, but they don't know what they're missing. And they will talk about sometimes their vacations and trips and, and the cars that they have or something. It's just, that's their life. And so they don't have the kids. And so I feel so blessed to have two sons that I have at 37 and 27. And knowing what I know now would have had probably another three or four kids. Cause I think it's great, but it's just, 
when you said that about your dad, I was thinking, you know, sometimes the, the child has to become the adult and you had to become the adult in this stop trying and I must be unlovable. Uh, it just shows you went out and were seeking or searching for answers. And what a great journey that started you on. Well, thank you. You know, and I feel like it's important to share that story because I feel like, you know, when people do what you and I do, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we write books and we are, speak, you know, professional speakers and, you know, like myself, creating films and, and all these different things, we think we look at some of these people and think, oh, well, these people have it all figured out. They haven't gone through challenges or struggled. And I think it's so essential I think one of my main messages is, is to let people know, you know, your healing matters. Yes. And as Jacob Lieberman says, you know, we're all the same height. So we're all in this together. Yeah. And I think there's something about that too, as I was thinking just the various things that you've done, films, as you mentioned, and the uh, books and the speaking and, and coaching and all the different things. And, but there's something about giving that authenticity to the fact that I always sometimes on stage will point down to my shoes and go, these shoes have walked this path. This is, I'm not teaching out of some book I checked out at the library and I'm going to tell you about positive psychology or something. I've walked down there and that's why the power of stories like your story, 13 years old. And that actually was, you were saying that brought back memories because I had something very similar until 16 everything was hunky-dory and the way I described it is we'd have steak so often because we had so much money that it was like gosh steak again tonight we just had it last night my parents go through a terrible divorce not even speaking to each other at 16 and now all I'm having is macaroni and cheese and I was kind of thinking about the days of steak well that was kind of nice I didn't realize it but it does give you such a basis from which to speak and people know that you have experienced it so you can speak so much more authentically Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think too, you know, David, I think part of it is that we also help people to hopefully inspire them and help them to understand that they too, even if they've never felt like they ignited it, like you and I had this beautiful spark, maybe even we took for granted mm -hmm. in, in the beauty of what our lives were as kiddos. And I think part of our journey, and even if you didn't actualize it, you can always come back to like that essence that is us. And that's cool. the spark we can always recapture, you know, and, and I literally had a sign in my kitchen that said, it's never too late to live happily ever after. Oh yeah. That's, that's, and I totally one. believe that. That's really great. So, so speak is, is this became your life's work? Talk a little bit about how your, your work journey, if you will, became what it is today, because for me, it was only nine, 10 years ago that I started doing this and I was 62 and it was very late in life, but I always wanted to be a speaker. But talk about how some of those experiences and morphed into what you did as a living and how you got to what you're doing now. Yes, thank you. Well, and I, I just, I always have to do this quick little blurb of, you know, my first year in college, I went to art school in LA. Like I had no idea this was going to be my path. Wow. And so through lots of serendipity, um, I ended up, you know, definitely working in, you know, mental health. And so I've had a 33 year career there. And I always tell people life begins at 50 mm -hmm. because I was 50 years old and now at almost 55. So it's, you know, almost five year journey of being one day in my office and I had the door cracked open and all of a sudden I hear this knock on the door and I had literally just been sitting there thinking, how do I get back into radio? You know, I'd been interviewed on a radio show and had been a guest speaker several times. And I just loved that media. I just loved reaching people that way. And in walked my, who used to be my producer and he sat down and he knew me a friend of a friend and said, Hey, have you ever thought about doing your own radio show? Mm, and he wow. said, I about came out of the chair. I was so excited. Uh -huh. And he said, you know, I work at the local radio station here. I'd love to produce a show for you. And so that's where it started. And from there, it was the absolutely phenomenal connections with people on the show, you know, whether it was Bruce Lipton, Larry Dossey, Jacob Lieberman, um, you know, the Capanellis, who are the big PBS, and, and now dear friends of mine, Ageless Living series is, is their series. Um, just grew this beautiful web and network of people. So it continued to be this evolving, you know, um, it took on a life of its own. It had this beautiful alchemy 
And so mm -hmm. through that came my first book, The Spark, Igniting Your Best Life. And then that was actually released right during the time, this is 2019, where I put together a summit bringing together 12 of those thought leaders. And that ended up becoming the film. And now I've just completed my, my second book, which will be coming out in June, uh, Becoming Fierce. That's right. Becoming creating fierce. a bold and beautiful life mm -hmm. and um, working with Anna Dara and Film Nest um, on a new series that's going to be coming out um, to a network. So lots of exciting things. I mean, so it's just continued to evolve and morph, you know, so I, yeah. I'm, I'm here right now in my private practice office. I still see private practice clients. I have my coaching clients with I adore and love. And now this new event with with six thought leaders coming together um, for the Becoming Fierce Women's event. Oh, that's so neat. And just and there are, you said, evolved and morphed and things like that. And it's really true. And just a lot of things. I know this in me, I started out just wanting to be a speaker. And then it got into coaching and it got into videos and YouTube and books and seminars and workshops and things. And it's just all around your central theme, which is neat. But I want to step back to the radio show when he said, uh, have you ever thought about doing your own radio show? As you got those guests and had a, a wide variety, but kind of the theme around this igniting your spark and, and, you know, again, the human condition, for lack of a better term, what were some of the guests or the subjects that kind of got you fired up the most? Because I'm sure you had some guests that were good, but I'm sure you had some that man, when you were done, you know, wow, that was mind blowing. Were, were some couple examples of that where it was just really beyond your expectations? Well, you know, I'd have to say, I, I have to share with you my first quote unquote, I mean, everyone is a big interview. Everyone is a wonderful interview. Mm -hmm. And, um, but my first, like one of my idols was Rick Hansen, the psychologist, Rick Hansen. Mm -hmm. And he had just written the book. It was just released at the time, Resilient. And when he said yes, I emailed him and he said yes, I was jumping up and down like a 19 year old who just got a ticket to, you know, her favorite rock stars concert. Yeah. And, yeah. and so what was so cool about that, that interview with him, I mean, it did, that one ended up opening so many doorways. And what he blew me away with was how candid he was. So wow. we shared oh a lot of his own personal journey. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so that was absolutely amazing. Um, so he really went into why he had the theories that he had, you mm -hmm. know, and, and his things around cultivating resilience was literally how you change your mind, mm -hmm. how you change some of those thought patterns, because he said, you know, my childhood, he said, was probably about a C minus. And there wasn't a lot of love to go around or attention. Oh, wow. Wow. And so because he was so bright at 16, found himself on a college campus mm. and, um, you know, he, he calls himself a self-proclaimed nerd. I mean, he's so bright, mm -hmm. but he said, I had a, an ocean of sadness inside of me. Wow. And so what he started doing, which unbeknownst at the time, just intuitively, what he started doing is when someone was kind to him, mm -hmm. he would actually stop and just marinate on it. For a moment just take those good feelings in mm -hmm. and what he didn't realize maybe consciously at the time was he was changing those neural pathways that were like you know i'm not seen or maybe i'm not important because you know he talks about that negative experiences are like velcro in the brain mm. and the brain's like i need that to help us survive and so it really holds on to that but positive experiences i say are more like you know fried eggs on a Teflon pan, they slide right out. Right, right. And so to give them some stickability, you know, all we have to do is pause. And, and so he started doing that. And what, gosh. Oh, I think we lost Stephanie. Hopefully she'll be back here in a second. While we're waiting for Stephanie, let us talk just briefly about the gratitude journal. Hopefully we'll just get her back here in a second, but I always like to make sure that people know the power of a gratitude journal and the one that I recommend. Oh, there it is in the, uh, actually in the background where it's the green screen, that gratitude guys, daily gratitude journal, something that can be very helpful. And 
the thing that is so important is actually writing in the journal. And so the way I'll just mention briefly, the way the journal is uh, laid out, the way if you template, if you will, is it's still based on five or six things that you're going to fill in every single day. You're going to start with the day and the date. Then you're going to make a little notation for what your daily number is. That can be one to 10. 10 is the best day of your life. One is a not so good day of your life. And you kind of take your temperature, if you will, there as well. And after that, it's the couple of lines for your daily circumstances, if you will, current events, things like that. And we will find that that's that. And we will find that there are special accounts, special events or certain things to the occasions of the day that you can note there. And then there's four or five lines for what you're grateful for. And after that, you have about five or six lines that you're going to fill in and just talk about it. It's a prompt on there. It says, well, I am so grateful for this. And so here comes Stephanie again. So I'll continue that in just a moment and we will get back to it. But then you wanted that write down the highlight of your day. Too. That's a very important aspect too, is what is the highlight? What is the best thing that happened to you yesterday or the day before, or even that morning, whatever that might be, you want to record that as well. And that way it plants it in your brain. Stephanie, are you back yet? Well, I, I am back. I apologize. My computer absolutely no crashed. So no worries. I've been filling them in. I've been filling the audience in on the benefits of a daily gratitude journal. And I'll just end up with this and we'll get back to Stephanie. The reason why it's so important to write in it, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. We all want to be empowered. So keep that in mind. So, so with our little electronic break there, uh, please continue, Miss Stephanie James. Yeah, thank you so much, David. So what, what I thought was really beautiful was what, what he really taught us is that we can start programming by, by just noticing what we wanna focus on. We were talking about how he would marinate on these positive experiences. And when we do that, we're telling the brain, hey, listen up, this is important. And so the brain will start to focus on those things for us. you know. And, and so we have this part of our brain called the reticular activating system. And that's the part of our brain that notices. So this might be something, David, that, that you know, like when you get a new car and you're like, oh my gosh, nobody has this car. It's so amazing. And pretty soon you start seeing that car everywhere. Right. It's not that there was a run on cars of that, that model of car, but it's because you are attuned to it now. Right. Correct. You're breaking it up. And so the same thing is true for us when we're focusing on, you know, something positive. Mm -hmm. we to see that and notice that we know that's true what we focus on expands yeah well and that's one of the reasons why even just on that little uh, electronic break there i was mentioning the gratitude journal because it's a very similar effect when you write it as i said what it empowers you but you focus on it and the reason that it's so important is because then you get your brain thinking about what you have and the antithesis of that is the person i'm sure we've people have heard this before but it's such a good analogy in the car sliding on ice. If you focus on the tree, you'll hit the tree. But if you focus on the open space, you'll hit the open space and you won't crash into the tree and so forth. So kind of where our, our energy goes, our direction flows type, type of thing and so forth. So, but let's, let's move on because I want to make sure I cover a couple of things in our time. Talk a little bit first. I want to talk about the film, but talk about the book, if you will, and maybe some of the highlights of the book, um, The Spark, Igniting Your Best Life. Sure. Well, you know, and, and there's really a difference, you know, in, in the two books, the first one is, you know, 30 years at the time of experience, um, interviews, client cases. And at the end of every chapter is this takeaway, the five top takeaways, but it really is how do you cultivate grit? How do you mm. cultivate resiliency? Um, Growing through grief is one of the chapters, and there's a chapter on revving up your relationship. So it truly is about how you can ignite the sparks in your own life. And the new book, Becoming Fierce, really is taking things to a whole new level, you know, with, with new research. And of course, in the, in the following four years since that book, the first book was written, so many more, you know, 
connections with with people like yourself mm -hmm. and experiences with clients and then taking my own story to a deeper level um, and really sharing from that authentic place where I think we're really able to make those connections and see, wow, I, I can resonate with that. I feel that in myself and know I can also heal and make these changes. So, yeah. and it truly is. I mean, that, that book is around our relationship with power. Mm. How do we having power over to becoming in power? Mm -hmm. in power me. Um, it talks about uh, the duality of surrender, of actually surrender being a strength instead of something that uh, we see as cowardice or waving the white flag. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and oh, yeah. sorry, Stephanie, Go I was ahead. just going to say, but going back to the the spark igniting your best life, when you mention grit, now that's not a word that I hear a lot, but I think it's a great word in resilience. Any possible tips or tricks that you can say around the grit or the resilience that somebody could have as a takeaway that here's a couple of things that you can do that would help you with that. Absolutely. So grit to me too is like this stickability, but it's stickability with ourselves. So when we're cultivating grit, part of what helps us is when we establish routines in our lives. And so it doesn't have to be something extensive. It could be a 20 minute routine but it's something that's predictable in this unpredictable world we live in that we know we can come back to over and over again. And so that, that sense of like, you know, and, and I really feel like they're together, the resiliency and grit, it's that I can withstand what's happening right now. I can learn how to go within. So maybe my morning routine is that I do 10 minutes of meditation and I do 20 minutes of exercise and then I'm going to listen to or read something that really lifts my spirits. Mm. Now, it's not, this is not about a bypass or ignoring what's happening in the world. It's saying, I can do these things that really fortify me. And then I make a commitment to myself so I know that I can rely on me to be there. Like, I have my own back. We can get through this and actually prime yourself for the day to be really wonderful. It's like priming heart, mind, body, and soul. Yeah. And, you know, when you said routine. And I think that, I, I don't know, I've probably always done something like this, but a year or so ago, I kind of named it the power hour. And it was kind of this idea with all these screens that were on and, and computers and cell phones and laptops and tablets and things like this, television. And I thought, you know what? And I got the idea from somebody, but it was uh, my version of the routine and get up and make your bed, you already accomplish something, the bed is made, take your shower, get dressed, get the coffee, have my vitamins, come in, write in the gratitude journal, five or 10 minutes for that, 15 minutes to meditate, 15 minutes to stretch, and then come in and turn on the computers and get going on the day. So I think developing that routine is really key. And you were talking about that too. And I just, I would imagine there's some people out there that have a tough time doing that, but that can sure be helpful, can it? Absolutely. I think it's a game changer. I absolutely do. And, and I remember, gosh, I don't know, a decade ago, maybe um, reading Hal Elrond's The Miracle Morning. And you know he was saying oh, yeah. if you can't or do six minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. these things again that you know they're predictable, they're dependable. You know you, there's continuity in your life, and I and I think that's you know that's a really big message for me that I share with my coaching clients and and even my therapy clients. It's like how do we build that muscle within yeah. us because it yeah. serves us so well. And it's so important too where people say to me, and I'm sure you've had the, the same question too, where you're on a podcast or speaking and it's questions or whatever. And well, what's, what's your final thought for the audience? What would you have? What's your biggest takeaway or whatever it might be? And that seems to be pretty common. And one of the things that I always say is take gratitude, for instance, for instance, it takes five or 10 minutes to write in a gratitude journal. That's all the way this thing in my case has a template. And I said, you know what, just write a sentence write a word, do it every day, write some three, three words, whatever it might be, because it's better to do less than you hope for than nothing at all. And so if you start out with a few words or a sentence, and maybe tomorrow it's two sentences and it builds and it kind of like you said, is a muscle and it gets better. But it's so interesting because everybody wants to get started, but the old cliche of every journey starts with one step, but sometimes you've got to have that step. And I think another thing, and I would imagine this is true with your, your coaching and your clients too, is that it seems to me the biggest thing there that people need is accountability. And there's something about that person that they know Stephanie's going to hold me accountable. I've got to follow through with her. And has that been your experience with most of your clients, do you think? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that that piece of, you know, and it's interesting because I'll have couples like in couple therapy. And I think some of the dynamic changes because they know they're going to have to come back and not just report to each other mm-hmm. how they on the relationship that there's now this third party that's like okay did you do your growth work this week right right you yeah. know i i see that in all areas of my life and i know it's true for me um morgan and i did the 75 hard challenge right before right. christmas mm-hmm. and i think you know had we not had each other it would have been really easy to say i don't want to work out twice you know, a day yeah i don't want to gallon of water today you know, and, and I think having each other, it just made it more fun. And, you know, we'd come home from going out and it might even be 11 o'clock. We're like, okay, we got to get that 45 minute workout in. And there's something about that accountability, the partnering, something. And I, I remember it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I just, I can tell you're very dedicated. Morgan is, I am very disciplined that we really want to accomplish the thought. But what is it about having that partner that takes it to another level? And the example I gave to a friend one day and he hit, he said something to me and it was just like a ton of bricks, what he said back. And I said, I was going to go meet my friend at the gym. And at the last minute he canceled. Now, if I'm going to meet him at the gym, there's a hundred percent chance I'm going to be there because I'm not going to not show up and I'm, I'm very reliable and I'm never late so so forth. But if he cancels now, it's like 50, 50, whether I'll go to the gym you know, I might or may not make it. And he says, wow, isn't it interesting? You'll honor a commitment to a friend, but not to yourself. And I just, man, that was like a sledgehammer. And I went, wow. And, and so, but I think maybe there's this element that we're still human. There's something about, maybe it's the interaction, like you said, you and Morgan can help each other become accountable. That just makes it better when you're sharing that quest or that journey or whatever it might be, I think. I think that's so true. You know, I hear that feedback all the time, honestly, from my coaching clients. That's who I mm-hmm. really hear it from mm-hmm. because we we have growth work every time we meet because right. it's not just the hour that we spend together twice a month. It's literally, what are you doing all the times in between? Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'll even follow up with, hey, if, if you're struggling with this, why don't you text me every day when you get done? Yeah. So then yeah. we're we're really just that first week breaking through maybe some of those hard wired patterns of behavior. And it's like, okay, you know, and when you have just that little bit, and, and I know that you know this too, just that little bit of that other person's attention right. and accountability to that person in those ways, you are going to think differently. Yeah, And that's, you know, I've had my own coaches as well, mm-hmm. you know, um, worked with Tom Cronin and Ken Foster and, they have helped because also they push you to that next level. Right. Right. Sometimes we can't see ourselves. You know, they would have belief in me that maybe I couldn't even have at the moment with myself. And so I, I do think that's essential. And so I, I always recommend to people that they find a coach or find a mentor or find an accountability partner. Cause we do, I mean, we're, we're, we're definitely, we're communal beings. Correct. We're interdependent beings and we need one another. Well, and it's interesting too. I totally agree with you. And I think that people that have said to me, they're a coach. Sometimes the first thing I ask them, do you have a coach? And, and I'd say half of them say yes, but half of them say no. I go, really? So it's okay. You can coach people, but you don't need coaching yourself. And that accountability piece is so important. And I think I love analogies and I love stories. And sometimes I, the book, the, whoever tells the best story wins. And there's been a lot about how you illustrate like yours at 13 year old, 13 years old, everything was fantastic. And then there's the car screeching down the driveway and so on and so forth. And so everything changed. But I think back on weightlifting in particular, the bench where you'd sit on the bench, you'd lift the weight. And if you're just doing it by yourself, you'd get so many reps in. But if you had your partner standing over there with his two fingers like this underneath the bar, you'd get two or three more reps. You would never get on your own because you you're just weren't sure you could do it. They are encouraging you. And then of course, if something happened, they'd catch the bar so it wouldn't come down and hurt you or land on your chest or something. But I just think it's so important that person takes you to that next level. And that's why I'm such a fan of coaching. And I think it makes such a difference. Absolutely. I'm totally with you on that. Yeah. So we'll we'll be wrapping up in a few minutes and I want to make sure I would be remiss if I didn't make sure because I sat down and watched a certain movie somebody sent me and I said, oh, I got to see this. So talk about the film. Yeah, thank you. Oh, my gosh. So the film When Sparks Ignite um, is a film and I, I feel like I can't yet say announce it because we're right moving into contracts right now. Oh, right. But uh, 
maybe by the time that this is out, you can put it in the notes, the network that is picking this up. Absolutely. And um, so what this came from is literally, I, I was doing a med meditation and after the meditation had this download of, wow, I know some of the most brilliant minds and serving hearts on the planet. What if they came together and we did an event that was totally different than when speakers just come and present and leave the stage? What if everyone came two days earlier and we had our own event, so to speak? So the 12 of us coming together and I mean, we meditated together. We had deep discussions. I interviewed everyone individually on their life challenges. And then we met as a whole. We sat around a table the second day, the 12 of us, and it was lights of the round table, just sharing life philosophies and what's important and how have we overcome challenges. And then after dining together and dancing together and really having the super cool alchemy um, that formed between us, all of the presenters, when we brought it to the live audience, stayed in the room. And it was such a powerful, like, again, coming back to that, we're all the same height. We're all in this together. Everyone supporting one another. And what came from that is this film that is truly about, you know, the challenges that we face that then become the match point within us that ignite, you know, a gift that we can truly bring to the world. So it's, it's, it's such a beautiful journey to see not only the presenters, but actually a client of mine who shares her story. So you see her journey throughout the film and how the sparks within her were ignited. So she went through, I mean, went from a life of abuse and feeling really that she couldn't function in the world to really giving back in a huge yeah. way. Do you think, I think when you said we're all the same height, and I think that's really neat. Another thing I've sort of thought about before is when I was growing up watching The Wizard of Oz and is there really somebody behind the curtain that really, really pulling all the levers, if you will. And I've met so many people and you mentioned um, earlier in a couple of guests that you had and like, oh my gosh, I'm almost intimidated this person, but they're really just another human being doing the best they can and they have their stories to tell and so forth. But through the making of the film, was there anything that would be close to be called a, a common thread that kind of went through the stories or that maybe you noticed you heard more than something else that was kind of your biggest takeaway? Yeah, I would say that there's, there's definitely one of the themes throughout the film is this thing about transformation and transformation of consciousness mm. and tra whether it's our thoughts, whether it's how we're showing up in the world. And so, I mean, there's such a huge focus on healing and how connected that we all really are. And that, again, you know, emphasizes why your healing matters mm -hmm. um, and that we are not. And ironically, you know, this was all filmed before COVID, but mm. I feel like the message is so powerful because it really is about it's a, it's a message, not just of hope, but of like realistic when we have Stefan Schwartz you know, speaking with us and, and, you know, whether it was Jacob Lieberman or Larry Dossie or the Capanellis, you know, everyone is sharing this message of you can be part of this transformation in consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that, so we haven't lost hope no matter what our circumstances are. And, you know, Stefan Schwartz is a scientist, you know, a research scientist. And so his data talking about you can be part of the tipping point, which is only 10%. I always thought it was 51%, but his research, you know, proves that it's, it's 10% of any given cohort, wow. whether it's a school or a church or a community. If there is a change in consciousness in that community, the whole cohort, excuse me, the whole cohort has to adjust. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Wow. Wow. So interesting. Well, we've got to wrap up. And so this has been fantastic as I of course thought it would be as a thought leader like Stephanie James. And so I always end up with the, the same last question that could relate to personal, it could relate to professional, it could relate to your career, whatever. But if you only got to pick one thing, what does Stephanie James know today? I think you said 55 that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you. Mm, wow, great question. Well, I'm not quite 55 yet. I've got oh, sorry, 54. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think you know, I uh, you know, and this is this is I think 
a message. I feel like I'm being really repetitive here, but part of it is that you are lovable, you do matter, and that each one of us matters. And so it's like our healing matters, our contribution matters. And so I, I would tell 18 year old Stephanie that number one, it only gets better from here. Mm. And truly learn how to have a relationship with yourself that you don't have to get your happiness, your love, you know, your fulfillment from outside of you. For me, I mean, it's about divine connection and then finding that within. And from there, then we can become these clear conduits to bring those gifts, you know, and that love healing spark back to the world. Well said, well said. And I have a whole module that called find yourself, find your talent, find your passion, find your purpose. I do when I'm speaking and it starts off with the relationship you have with yourself. I contend it's the most important relationship you have. And there's ways to, if it's not good and you're not feeling lovable or you're not feeling that you matter, there's ways and things you can do to change that. And as you get a better relationship with the person you see brushing your teeth in the morning, everything just seems to work better. So well said. Well, thank you so much. And let me tell everybody as I wrap up here, just a couple of reminders. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. And it's available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. And I know that people are struggling with a lot of life issues. And so it's important that they may need some additional support. So I have a gratitude coaching program that covers things like the anxiety, the depression, the jobs, health, and family, and friends, and issues that people are struggling with. And my clients dramatically shorten their learning curve and to get a derailed life back on track. So I offer a 30 minute coaching consultation to offer you some on the spot coaching to see if I might be able to help. And so to schedule your 30 minute coaching consultation, text the word coach, C-O-A-C-H to 206-371-8309. And then I will send you back a link to the scheduler and you can get that booked. And as I mentioned earlier too, gratitude keynote, speaking, coaching, books, all that is available at thatgratitudeguy.com. And the last thing is a lot of people like to get my Monday morning minute. I send out a 60 second video every Monday morning. It's, I've been doing that for six or seven years now. And if you'd like to get that, you can get that by texting. Go to your text and text in the number 22828. That's five digits, 22828. And in the message box, type in the words gratitude guy, all one word, hit send, and you'll get a link to sign up for that. So thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks again, Stephanie. And to all of you, remember, I tell you every single week, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.